Views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hello and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit. It's episode 510 and I am so happy to welcome back to the show our old friend, it's Michael Seleski. Welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me back. It's really glad, good to be sitting in the seat and uh, talking movies with you again. It's always exciting to have you Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Um, we've got a, a wide range of movies this We've week. got some very different movies. Three movies, but yep. they're all very different. Um, and uh, the first one is one that I've been very excited for because it is, uh, I, I believe, the last Best Picture nominee that we have had a chance to see and review here. So you've so. gotten a chance to see them all then? Every, everything else, every yeah. other movie, very but good. this was the last holdout. So let's get started with what we have on the marquee this week. Well, so you and I are big fans of A24, and I went into this movie completely blind. I knew nothing about the plot. I didn't even know that it was distributed by A24. Uh, the movie that we're talking about is The Zone of Interest. This movie was so challenging to watch, and it was it got more challenging as soon as you realize that what you're actually getting is a slice-of-life movie mm -hmm. about a couple Nazis. Yeah. In specific, we're following the uh, commandant of Auschwitz, young Rudolf Hess and his wife Hedwig Hess, as they deal with the running of the house that they live in just outside the gates of Auschwitz. The movie doesn't portray any of the immense evil that took place in their backyard, but the existence of that evil is omnipresent. It lingers in the background of every shot. The fires and the smoke of the chimneys are the backdrop of this entire plot. The plot that we do have is pretty thin on the ground. Rudolph is being promoted from his current position, and Hedwig is not happy about having to leave the big, beautiful house that she has worked hard to establish behind. And by worked hard, I mean in theory, because she's helped by a lot of housekeepers and groundskeepers that are prisoners of the Reich, for lack of a better term. This movie highlights the banality of evil. These two main characters don't do much on screen to underline the utter inhumane evil that, that are being perpetrated and are being enacted upon the Jews, the Poles, the Roma peoples, the invalid, and anyone else that the Third Reich castigated as the Untermensch. Zone of Interest shows to highlight how shockingly close we as a people can get to that inhumanity. The movie doesn't give any sort of epilogue to the final outcome of Rudolf Hess and his wife, but I will. Rudolf Hess was captured at the end of World War II and handed over to the reformed Polish government, who tried and hung him for crimes against humanity. Before his execution, he wrote, quote, Based on my present knowledge, I can see today clearly, severely and bitterly for me, that the entire ideology about the world in which I believed in so firmly and unswervingly was based on completely wrong premises and had to absolutely collapse one day, end quote. Hedwig, the wife, survived her husband and passed away in 1989 while visiting one of her children who had emigrated to the United States. This movie is not one that I'll be returning to. It's a very good film, and I'm better for having seen it, but its message sits uncomfortably in the psyche. Not every movie has to be this, but I'm really glad that this movie can still find audiences. You say you won't return to this movie, and... One of the things about this movie is I keep returning to it. Oh, no, I, I keep returning to it in my head, absolutely. That burns into my psyche, and a lot of it is exactly what you're saying, is the, the normality of humdrum family life mere feet from the most atrocious, disgusting imagery and ideals. Yeah. And how the movie opens with, you know, Nazis having a birthday party in full SS regalia. And, and we're just having a party right there. And and it, it, the, I think it, the, the opening of this movie does a lot to kind of set itself up where, I don't know about you, like I said, I didn't know anything about this movie going I in. I didn't know that the Hesses, that these were actual people until after I saw the movie okay. and did a little research. Yep, I, I also did a little research too. I, I, I think like most young history buffs, you go through a World War II Absolutely. Uh, a period, and this was in my wheelhouse at one point. But, you know, um, the, openings, the opening couple minutes where you walk in and you think almost is there a technical glitch because the screen stayed right. black yeah. for must have been close to two minutes. Yes, yeah, I think so. And I think all of the, the music, uh, the soundtrack music in this is just off-putting and it's meant to put you uh, at 
you know, at, at a disadvantage. And mm -hmm. I think it really does that. Um, I enjoyed that it was entirely in German. I, yeah. I took six years of German, so I could follow quite a bit of it, but mm -hmm. not not all of it sure. by any means. Um, but I, I think it, it works really well as that. And yeah, this is one of those movies that I woke up the next morning, um, and the thing that struck at me most was just the banality of it. Because it's not... The, the director, Jonathan Glazer, goes out of his way to not take us to the other side of that wall. Yep. We know what's on the other side of that wall. Yes. Right? You can hear the dogs barking, the gunshots, mm -hmm. the screams, the omnipresent smoke of the crem crematories. We know what's on the other side of that wall. And what's shocking is how easily these people can just ignore that and they just go about their life. And Hedwig especially. I mean, she's like more worried about, they got a swimming pool. She, she doesn't want to leave her Eden that she's built. Her beautiful garden. Yeah, she comes off really bad in this. And her main thing is like, well, the first time we meet her, she's pillaging the clothes of yep. of dead prisoners, uh, searching for valuables, parceling them out to other people, telling her husband like, when you go off to work, hey, if you can get some chocolates off some of dead some of the dead people, I'd love some chocolates. Yeah, and I, I, I find any of those Jewish chocolates. The the thing it's horrifying. That, I, I think the thing that struck me the most was at one point when she has a confrontation with her her mother, or her mother uh, decides to leave kind yeah. of abruptly. And she ends up having a confrontation with one of the housekeepers. Oh. And she just sort of uh, offhandedly comments of, uh, I'll tell your husband to throw your ashes around your hometown. Yeah. And you're just like, I mean, this, this is the casualness of evil, but mixed with just this, you know, the, the, they're going through their lives. This could be a story about almost anybody doing anything, but yes, it's about... it's a family story. It's Unfortunately, a, it, like it's, at one point, Rudolph is meeting with his other SS folks, and they're just casually discussing this new yep. cremation device of the circular incinerator to, to be able to process more things through there. It kind of struck... And it's terrifying it, how simple it is, and then they come back like, yeah, you know what, let's go with it. That's a great idea. Yeah. It struck me very similar to, I think, uh, an HBO movie that they made several years ago now. I think it's almost 10 or 15 years ago. It was called Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. It had all of these great British actors going yes. around and very mundanely speaking about the nuts and bolts of the Holocaust. Yeah. And it had a very similar, of course, that was a far more tech, uh, technical, and, and it had sort of a conclusion to this. This movie ends very abruptly, and in a, an incredibly powerful last 10 minutes once you realize what's being shown in those last 10 minutes i like i say i don't foresee that there's going to be a, a mood that i'm ever going to be in where i'm going to be like hey you know what i really want to plug yeah. in and watch zone of interest it's to, just to bring, bring up my mood but um, it's just horrifying how it sheds a light on how the human psyche is capable of getting to this point yep and rationalizing rationalizing what's over there because they had a conversation in the middle of that movie where she realizes that the lifestyle that she's living is the lifestyle that she always wanted and yeah. she doesn't put the second part of that puzzle in right. where hey you're living this lifestyle based on the suffering it's and like the if I utter leave destruction that, if i leave that piece out then it's fine if yeah, i don't think about it it's fine yeah and I, for me it was this sense of dread that really ate away at my stomach while i was watching this movie because it is the banality of regular life but i never was a, allowed myself to relax into that because I kept thinking of what was what was on the other side of that wall, right? Yep. You could, if you were more cold, you could just sit back and it's just, it's just a family drama. You and know, but it's... I, I, I judge it, a lot of these movies, uh, especially movies like this, based on how you feel as you're walking out of the, the movie yeah. theater. And with that just deeply jarring music and the, the, the thoughts running through your head as you're walking out of that theater, it... It hits you right in it there. Does. It's a very powerful film. And Sandra Huller, who plays Hedwig, also she's nominated uh, for Anatomy of a Fall, another great yep. foreign language film from this year. She's great in this. Um, this film has been nominated for Best Picture, Best International Film, Sound direct Directing, and Adapted Screenplay uh, at this year's Oscars. I think it's going to do well. It's I, I certainly think it's got <laughs> it's it's one of the better foreign films I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, it was put out by the the Polish Film Institute, yeah. and uh, the people of Poland have an axe to grind with the Third Reich and, and the Nazis, <laughs> Fair as I think enough. as I think most people do. Yeah. So uh, I I knew as soon as I, that it was going to be put out by the Polish Film Institute that they they weren't going to be candid about Pull it, or no casual punches. about it. So. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what did you end up giving uh, the Zone of Interest? Like I say, the only thing that stopped me from giving this a perfect score is that I don't. Don't really foresee a chance where I'll ever rewatch it. I mm -hmm. gave it four out of five. Yeah, I uh, I gave it four and a half out of five. It's a it's a powerful film. Very. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a quiet walk out of that theater when you're done. Oh but, yeah. Uh, high recommend for both of us. Uh, let's turn to the next film we have on the marquee. It is the newest film from director Matthew Vaughn, who is 
known uh, most notably for the Kingsman trilogy mm -hmm. of films. This is a film called Argyle. Uh, stars uh, Bryce Dallas Howard as Ellie Conway. She is a best-selling author of a spy series following her spy, Argyle, who is represented in her visions by Henry Cavill in a terrible wig. Uh, he's your <laughs> Ethan Hunt or James Bond type traveling the world, defeating bad guys and betting the ladies. Um, and her next novel is hotly anticipated because somehow the events that she writes about have a way of coming to fruition in real life, but she's stumped on how to come to an end for her next spy story when she suddenly has a man claiming to be a real spy sit down across from her on a train. It's a man named Aiden Wilde, played by Sam Rockwell. He knows all about Ellie and the trouble she's in, trouble that she's actually unaware of. Uh, the bad guy organization called The Division, led by Brian Cranston as Director Ritter, is trying to find her and him separately, and this leads to a big fight aboard the train with Aiden fighting wave after wave of bad guys, and Ellie is caught seemingly between the real world and her fictional one, really weirdly alternatingly seeing Aiden and her fictional hero Argyle during this fight. I didn't care for that sequence. It's a pretty hokey idea. Uh, but Aiden is offering her help, claiming to be the Argyle that she writes of, but he needs her to write the final chapter in order to see what will happen next. And everyone's after them, no matter where in the world they go, and she spends a large chunk of the film not believing what Aiden is telling her despite seeing things happening in front of her. And for my money, this movie got dumber and dumber as it went along. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, as it spun its story and as it runs towards its conclusion and eventual mid credit scene, I was left confused and beleaguered and I didn't really care uh, about all this. It's th throwing all these twists at you. I didn't like Bryce. I like Bryce, Bryce Dallas Howard. I didn't like how she was made to respond to all these twists that were happening to her. Um, I will invest myself in anything that Sam Rockwell does because mm -hmm. I think he's hilarious he's and he's great. great. It seems like he's having fun in here. But for me, the duality of the story storytelling inherent in this between her real world and her fictional world and her story world and the attempt at something crazy that happens in the credits didn't work for me at all. And I'll tell you another thing. I went and saw this movie last week. I fell asleep in the middle of it and oh, slept no. through about 40 minutes of it. Had to go back and rewatch it yesterday to Poor fill thing. in that gap. And, uh, you, you know, the first time I was very confused when I woke up and mm -hmm. wasn't quite sure what was going on in the final 45 minutes. And I'm like, I think that might have been a decent movie. And then I filled in the gap yesterday. It wasn't. My opinion changed. You know, I, I think this movie, um, if you try to analyze the plot, if you try to really enjoy the plot, you're going to be left feeling wanting. If you're yes. able to shut your mind off and just sort of let... Um, you know, Matt Vaughn's sort of motif, his, 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 um, his Kingsman kind of oeuvre kind of yeah. marinate in you, then I think you're really going to enjoy it or at least enjoy parts of it. I really thought Sam Rockwell was great. Yeah. I've always enjoyed Samuel L. Ja yeah, Samuel he, Jackson when right. he shows up. Um, you know, Cranston, Brian Cranston did a great job. I mean, he's just barking at people to do things. Yeah, it's, you know, I, <laughs> it's I, great. I, I, think, I think that there's enough here to distract uh, to distract from the fact that the plot is oh, it's garbage. nonsense. It's nonsense plot, and they it, they just start coming up with weird twists. I mean, one of the main twists in the movie I saw within the first five minutes. The well, yeah. movie told me what the twist was going to be at the end. Well, yeah. Um, well, and, and, I felt like this was a parody of Matthew Vaughn's previous movies, though. Yeah, and I I, f I feel like he's trying to find some some hidden space in between. James Bond movies and Austin Powers movies. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not and I'm not sure that if you try to find that middle ground you're going to do very well. You either go all Austin Powers and I think this this movie had a chance to be all of the the special special effects action scenes, the goofy stuff with the smoke that we saw. Yeah. It had a chance to be that. It's if opening it scene. If it would have winked at itself just a little bit more. Yep. I think I think it had done better, but when it tries to take itself seriously, the plot doesn't stand up to ev no. even minor uh, scrutiny inside your head. When you realize that the premise of the movie is the idea that these real life spy agencies are trying to f fi find the author of this because she's able to predict the future that hasn't happened yet. That Doesn't make any sense in, to me. It makes no sense in the past. Nothing, um, nothing. I like Matthew Vaughn a lot, but. I love the I love the Kingsman. I love the first Kingsman. I feel like his movies have steadily taken kind of a I step down. I feel like he got successful enough where people are afraid to tell him no. Yeah, because that last Kingsman movie, the I last Kingsman movie was rough. And like, 
the the nods to continuing episodes in the Kingsman, I'm not super excited about. I don't think we have to worry about that. I mean, there are nods like in this one, she orders a Statesman whiskey, which yep. is the whiskey from the second one. There's little nods, and then there's things in the in the credits in the, in the credits that scene. are very blatant. But unfortunately, this movie lost a ton of money. Well, I mean, it, it's a two hundred million dollar movie. You see the price tag on this yeah, one? Yeah, two hundred million dollars made twenty million dollars on opening weekend against zero competition, really. No, there's not a whole lot else out and, there, and nobody showed up for this. Uh, we went to a, we went to a, a, a showing of it, and there wasn't a whole lot of people in the audience. Yeah. I don't know if the advertising hasn't been good about this. That can't be because one of my thoughts about this movie is. I was very happy that it's finally out because I was finally able to stop seeing the trailer. <laughs> because I've seen this trailer in front of every movie for two straight months. Yep. And the Who's Argyle twist uh, in that cat flying in the air. Are, I've seen that trailer a thousand times. Are you following the actual real life? Uh, the, curfew, drama, the, the, real the life drama? The Taylor Swift drama? Whether Taylor Swift is the person that ghost wrote it. Oh or God. there's an actual book, Argyle, and nobody knows who the actual author is. It's two ghost writers. It, it seems all too coy to have uh, come out at basically the same time of the movie. They put movie. it out two weeks before the, hmm. the movie, hoping I, people would read it and I'm, be like, what is the story? I'm, I'm wondering, if, um, I'm wondering if they had anything to do with the putting out of that book. I'm, I'm calling BS on all of that. Total nonsense. Sense. It reminds me of when, um, uh, 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 what was the Will Smith, Jaden Smith, After Earth, yeah. that atrocity, when that movie came out, uh, apparently there was also a uh, encyclopedia-sized compendium book that came with it that had the all the backstory and all the languages and the everything that was supposed to tie along with this yeah. movie for the ultimate eight-picture Franchise it was about to become. This is the this is the last <laughs> spasmatic uh, quiverings of old Hollywood where they think they can do like book tie-ins to a generation that yeah. gets their entertainment from TikTok videos. I I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah, that was all very strange. Um, what did you end up giving Argyle? I know this is going to sound wrong. But I still gave this four out of five. I like I say, if you can shut your brain off. I think there's enough uh, flashing lights and uh, the the <laughs> the cast the cast, the cast is, is a good. lot of fun. The I cast is a lot of fun. Um, Shut your mind off and enjoy the movie. That's my it. problem was the first time I saw it, I shut my mind off too much. And Put, me right to sleep. <laughs> Put me right to sleep. And you know what? I didn't bother anyone in the theater because no one else was there. <laughs> uh, and I said on rewatch, it was it disappointed me greatly. I ended up giving Argyle two out of five stars. Uh, I, I usually don't. This. I usually don't say I'm wrong, but Rabbit's right. I'm, I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just not a fan. Uh, all right, let's move ahead to what we have on our streaming spotlight this week, where we turn to Netflix for this documentary that I was quite excited for. It's a film called The Greatest Night in Pop from director Bao Wen. Uh, it's a documentary about We Are the World. It's a document focused on what, into, what went into creating the massively successful charity song We Are the World, the massive undertaking to even make it happen. It's 1985 and it's soon after the UK supergroup Band-Aid, created by Bob Geldof, uh, released Do They Know It's Christmas as a huge charity song. And Harry Belafonte, the iconic singer and activist, became a driving force for an American charitable song to raise money and awareness for famine-stricken Africa and specifically Ethiopians. And this documentary is filled with archival documentary footage, talking heads from some of the more important people who made it happen. Uh, we see how Lionel Richie and Quincy Jones enlisted Michael Jackson to be the creative force behind writing this anthem. And it's 1985, Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson were at the height of their fame and influence and power. And after having written the basics of this song, the daunting task of getting the greatest collection of singers together in one place at one time to record this single together, a scheduling nightmare. Uh, we see Lionel Richie, who was hosting the American uh, Music Awards and also winning a ton of them himself at that time. Uh, the decision was made in utmost secrecy to have everyone involved leave directly from the awards show, skip the after parties, meet at the studio, and do this thing all in one night on January 28th of 1985. And this film uh, shows the clash of personalities that happens, the collection of talent, the, the nightmare of trying to decide who gets solos, who gets partnered up next to each other, handling of egos when you have Diana Ross there and she doesn't get a solo, but Al Jarreau I was getting is getting a solo. I was getting secondhand anxiety watching all of the, 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 the coordination of this. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I this We Are the World is like right in the heart of my 
burgeoning love for pop culture and pop music, 1985. I'm eight years old. I'm a little bit younger than you, so yeah, this yeah. is a bit before my time. I mean, I burned this single out when it came out. Oh, sure. I this thought is it was banger. amazing. Um, uh, your, your, your thoughts on this documentary? I mean, I am... This, this being said, I come at this from a couple different angles. I've got a couple different horses in this race. Mm -hmm. uh, people who know my political ideology know that I like Harry, Bel Harry Belafonte for a lot sure. of reasons. I uh, love his music. I was really glad to, see, glad to see him and the the esteem in which uh, the pop music scene still held Harry Belafonte yeah. at this time when he really hadn't been you know producing been time. music since the 50s, yeah. since the 60s. So uh, that, but then again, I am a Minnesotan, and Minnesotans will tell you that Prince yeah. is close to a deity for us. And to see Prince sort of cast as a wannabe villain in this thing. Kind of. He, there, there, the, this is a movie without a villain. There's not yeah. like there's an arc here. But, um, but they wanted him so badly to be in this. And it seems like they kind of bent over backwards to try to shoehorn him into I mean, this. He's the guy who wasn't going to play second fiddle. He wasn't going to play second fiddle. Apparently him and, and, and Michael Jackson had a lot of beef. Sure. And the fact that they couldn't get them in a room to do this thing, uh, is, as a Minnesotan, was very sad for me. <laughs> yeah. So if my, my score at the end of this is artificially low, it's because <laughs> of my uh, ride-or-die nature for Prince and the Revolution. I love that we have all this footage that Quincy Jones and Lionel Richie uh, we're prescient, prescient enough to have <laughs> cameras in the room for this, and that that's kind of frozen now, and we're able to see these things. I love that. Uh, you know, I never knew that Waylon Jennings decided to just leave. When yes, like, are you talking Swahili? I'm out of here. <laughs> you know, and, there, there is so much. There's so much gem in this. There's is. there's so much stuff from behind the scenes. The Cindy Lauper stuff. Yep. The uncomfortableness of Bob Dylan. As a, another Minnesotan, right. Bob Dylan, true to my heart, I was really happy to see he his his role in the last part of this movie. I think is really touching. It is. Um, Bob that, Dylan. How, everyone came around him. Come on, Bob, and he's self doubting himself. Yeah, because he, he hadn't he hadn't been at the top of his pop game for 10, 15 years. Right. Ever since he switched from uh, from acoustic to electric, it's it's such a it's such an, an interesting movie. Uh, there are so many times where the blind leading the blind. There oh are so God. many one liners in yes. here. A little little nuggets to, to leave on to that if you're a child of the 80s, a child of the 90s, you grew up with this music, there's going to be something to recommend in this for you. Yeah, I mean... And also, you gotta, you got to appreciate their, um, their restraint in not making this a five-part miniseries right. with cliffhangers kinda, at the end of every okay episode. With that. <laughs> I am, too. Because I love getting the Huey Lewis talking about it. Huey it, Lewis The stuff great. with Cyndi Lauper and Bruce Springsteen and... and just getting to see the talent of Michael Jackson again as he just steps in, yep. like, I'll just nail this. All right, no big deal. And how Lionel Richie was really had to be the guy to come in and like, okay, we need to get this done tonight. And I, I know right? you, I know you come from a music background as, as mm -hmm. well as I come from a music background. The idea of having that many big egos oh in one room, yes. and at at one point, I think it was Quincy Lewis or Quincy Jones, Quincy who, Jones yeah. who came out and said, you know, if this train stops rolling, if the momentum stops at any point, yeah. it's going to divulge into just everybody having their own opinions and yeah. ha having their own yeah, because you ideas. know, Stevie wanted to throw things in, but I mean. And then you look at the the chorus in the background. It's like, well, Smokey Robinson's just singing in the chorus. You do feel Ross. <laughs> the one thing I wanted, though, every time as a kid growing up, every time I watched the video of We Are the World, I always wanted the answer. Why was Dan Aykroyd? Why there? is Dan? And they Aykroyd never addressed it in this documentary. And because his name is first in alphabetical yes. order, he's always listed first in this. Why is what I is Dan Aykroyd doing there? I understand he was a blues brother, brother, That's but I don't think he was enough. the one that sang. That's not good enough. But you know, for this time period, this is 1985. I mean, this is also the same year the Super Bowl Shuffle came out, the 85 Bears. I mean, this was a big time for iconic b music. This was the height. This, this was, was uh, to me, for pop music, This it, it kind of comes downhill from here. Well, this was the biggest selling, sum, biggest selling single of the 80s and eventually was cited as being the best selling single in the history of American music. Sold 20 million copies of this single. And Waylon Jennings stuff. didn't want to be honest. Didn't want to I can't, I'm going to do it Swahili. Uh, <laughs> all right, what did you end up giving the greatest night in pop, sir? The only reason I gave it a three out of five was because of the uh, the unnecessary Prince derogation <laughs> and the fact that it's only an hour and a half long. I wanted more. I absolutely wanted more. I wanted more answers. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed this. I had quite a bit of fun with it. Uh, I ended up giving it four out of five. It's streaming over on Netflix. It's certainly worth an hour and a half of I your mean, time. I mean, just look at really famous people. You're going to have powers. a good time watching Absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right, let's take a look ahead at what is coming soon. The weekend of uh, February 16th, I have a few films. First, 
Madam Web, Cassandra Webb, develops the power to see the future, which forces her to confront her past while forming a bond with three young women with powerful destinies. Uh, stars Dakota Johnson, Sydney Sweeney. We also have, speaking of uh, iconic music, we have Bob Marley, One Love, the story of how Ooh, reggae icon, yeah, Bob Marley overcame adversity and the journey behind his revolutionary music stars Kingsley ben as Bob Marley. We have Land of Bad, about a rookie Air Force com combat controller and a seasoned drone pilot have to support a Delta Force team as they try to shift a mission gone wrong into a rescue mission. Stars Milo Ventimiglia, Russell Crowe, and Liam and Luke Hemsworth. Uh, we also have The Abyss, Swedish film about a woman who is a security manager at a mine who has to fight for her life and her family's lives when her city begins collapsing into the mine. And lastly, the pod generation in a not-so-distant future, a tech giant offers couples the opportunity to share their pregnancies via detachable wombs or pods. What a great idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> sir, I want to thank you real quick for always being eager to join me on this show, being willing to watch whatever crappy movie I throw at you, <laughs> being prepared and being honest in your reviews. Yep. I really appreciate it. This is, unfortunately, we have 11 episodes left. This will be the last time I yep. have you sitting with me, but I, I really have appreciated it. Really, it's really been a joy on my end. And I wanted to give you a, a going away gift. Okay. I, I know you're still going to be around here, uh -huh. but uh, this, this is a very personal gift for me. It is a Blu-ray copy of Repo, the genetic opera. <laughs> um, the first job I ever had in college, I worked at a family video uh -huh. in Shawano, um, in, up, up by Green Bay. And our manager had a, we, we get the DVDs and the Blu-rays that would come out, um, you know, a couple weeks out in advance. Sure. And he would allow us to take the movies when they came in early. And he wanted us to take as many of them as possible because he liked that we could give recommendations yeah, be to people. Be knowledgeable when they came in on a Friday night. Hey, what's good? What do you recommend? I'm looking for something a little off the ball. Sure. And one of the first titles I picked up was <laughs> Repo the Genetic Opera. One of the crazier movies ever made. One of the crazier movies that ever made. <laughs> Alex Vega is in this. Uh, Anthony Stewart had Paris Hilton. What yeah. is Sarah Brightman doing in this? Uh, the, the ghost of Paul Servino's career is, is shuffling this thing. This movie is thing. so weird. Um, but I watched that movie. It opened my eyes that some of the out-of-the-wall stuff that you know nothing about, yeah. that you've not heard a thing about, can be some of the most enjoyable stuff. And, and being able to have a conversation with people that you don't know anything about, about a movie that you just kind of saw, it was sort of magical. And watching your reviews, getting invited to come on, and watching some of the stuff that you've made me watch yeah, over sure. the years, <laughs> Uh, it brought back those feelings for me, yeah. and so I really wanted to give you this copy. I love this. Uh, I do not I, have this in my collection. I really hope you enjoy it because I I, I will talk about this for forever. I well, really like it. I like the stuff that they came out with afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Devil's Carnival. Yep. Um, it's really weird, kitschy stuff. Well, and these these cult type movies yes. are so much fun when you find someone else who loves it too, or who's even seen it. Yeah, and you're like, oh. A kindred spirit. And I, and I know I, I talked it up when I worked at the family video in yeah. Shano because basically every week for three or four months, this thing was checked out. You ruined some people's Friday nights with this. Who <laughs> brought it home and are like, what, like is, think, what is this? I like to think I helped people's Friday sure, nights. And sure. shout out to family video, rest in power. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they were a great organization for I so long. Them. I loved them. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you, sir. There you are. Uh, I appreciate this. This Thank will go you. right on my wall of physical media, which is... The Physical media thing. is king. That's right, absolutely. All right, let's. Uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Marcus Theaters, the Palace here in Sun Prairie. Thank you for sponsoring this program for all these many years. We do appreciate that. Love some dream loungers. Next week, I'm going to be talking about some films such as Lisa Frankenstein, Out of Darkness, the the end we start from a couple anime movies, Orion in the Dark, The Tiger's Apprentice, and I have a first time guest. As I'm ending the oh, show, wow. a first time guest that I've been so excited to get on. Uh, I am, uh, my 10 year old daughter is joining me Aww, on the show. Oh, isn't that wonderful? She was born not too long before this show started. Yeah. And she is joining she's, me. She's lived the life of it. I'm so incredibly excited that for this. That is cool. So uh, tune in next week to uh, to see me and my daughter talking about some movies. Uh, I might get a little misty during the show. Just She'll do better than I do, that's oh. for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm not going to make her watch blood. some of these weird ones. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyways, until that time next week, I'm Jameson. I'm Michael. Have a great week. <laughs>